You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. This episode is called The Birds. 60-year-old Douglas Wise knelt down inside of his garden, pulling weeds out of the small vegetable patch behind his townhouse in Queens, New York. It was August 1999, and just like every other day that summer, it was hot and muggy. Doug's shirt stuck to his back as he worked. After he finished pulling up all the weeds, he sprayed the soil with some weed killer. He paused for a moment to admire the fat tomatoes ripening on the vines he'd planted that spring. He intended to use every one of them in homemade marinara sauce. When his garden was looking neat and trim, Doug gathered the weeds into a garbage bag and then took them to the compost bin inside of his garage. Doug tried not to gag as he opened the lid. On hot days like this, the bin could smell absolutely disgusting. He dumped the weeds onto the decaying pile of eggshells and table scraps. Then, to help the composting process along, he took a bucket of rainwater he'd collected the week before and poured a little into the bin. He smiled to himself, knowing how his wife Carmen quietly hated that he collected rainwater in large buckets, but it had actually come in handy earlier in the summer when they'd gone more than a month without rain. Doug had enough water for composting and a little extra for his garden, all while being able to conserve tap water. Doug closed the bin and then grabbed a beer from the garage refrigerator and sat in a folding chair on the porch near the sidewalk. After a few hours in his garden, Doug liked to have a drink and people watch. It was his idea of a perfect Sunday afternoon. When Doug finished the last of his beer, he tossed the can into a recycling bin and headed inside for a shower. He was careful not to touch anything on his way to the bathroom. Carmen had just cleaned the house from top to bottom, and she'd kill him if she saw dirt smudges on anything. After Doug rinsed off and had some dinner, he joined his wife in the living room to watch some TV. But as he sat there, he started to feel a headache come on, and so he began rubbing his temples, and he wondered if maybe staring at the screen and straining his eyes was causing this headache. So he asked his wife to turn off the TV. But even after she did, over the next few minutes, his headache only got worse. Doug finally went to the kitchen and took some aspirin. And while that did help his head feel a bit better, his stomach now started to feel queasy. And so Doug told his wife that he just didn't feel right, and so he was going to go to bed early. He wasn't sure if maybe he ate something bad or if he was actually getting sick, like with the flu. Carmen agreed that he should just go to bed because after all, he'd spent the whole day in the yard under the beating sun. Doug kissed his wife goodnight and headed upstairs, hoping to feel better in the morning. But the next morning, when his alarm went off at 7 a.m., he was groggy and still had a headache, and his stomach still churned. Next to him, his wife had sat up, and she turned to him and said, you know, you better get up if you don't want to be late for work. But Doug asked her to grab the phone for him because he felt absolutely terrible and he needed to call in sick. Three days later, Carmen ladled some chicken noodle soup into a bowl, then placed it on a tray alongside a glass of ginger ale and some saltine crackers. Carefully, she carried it all up the stairs to the bedroom. Doug was in the bedroom, in bed, propped up on pillows. After three days of feeling totally sick, he'd lost a lot of fluids and looked very pale. As she set the tray onto the bedside table, she told her husband that she'd also bring him up a Gatorade. Carmen frowned as Doug nodded feebly. Her husband had been sick only a handful of times over the years, and when he was, it was rarely for more than 24 hours, and he had never been this weak and pale. Whatever bug her husband had caught, it had knocked him flat out. Carmen left the bedroom and headed downstairs to get the Gatorade from the fridge, and then when she had it, she went back up the stairs, and when she went back into the bedroom, she was surprised to see that Doug was not eating his soup. She asked if he was hungry, and Doug said that he was, but he said his hands were not steady enough to hold the bowl. Then he asked for Carmen's help walking to the bathroom. He said he was just too weak to get up on his own. Now Carmen was truly concerned. As she helped her husband to his feet and led him to the bathroom, she did her best to conceal her worry. Once Doug came out of the bathroom and was tucked back into his bed, Carmen asked him if he'd like her to feed him some soup. But Doug didn't respond. Instead, he just kind of stared out the window like he didn't even hear her. For several moments, Carmen spoke Doug's name with increasing urgency, but he just continued his glassy stare saying nothing. Carmen was now terrified. She thought maybe Doug was having a stroke. So she grabbed the phone and called 911. It took a few minutes for an ambulance to arrive. While they waited, Carmen sat on the edge of the bed as Doug seemed to slip in and out of a trance, 
at times barely registering what was happening around him. By the time the paramedics arrived and moved Doug onto a stretcher, he was barely conscious. Carmen followed the paramedics downstairs and then out to the ambulance waiting in the driveway. She prayed silently as two EMTs hoisted up Doug's stretcher and secured it in the back of the ambulance. Then one of the men turned around and offered Carmen a hand, helping her into the back of the ambulance as well. Carmen took a seat on the bench, keeping one hand on her husband. As they sped towards the hospital, for the first time in her life, Carmen worried about losing her husband. Once the ambulance arrived at Flushing Hospital, Doug was rushed into the emergency room while a nurse brought Carmen to the waiting area. After about a half hour, a doctor wearing scrubs and a lab coat approached Carmen and brought her to Doug's room. Doug was lying in bed, still looking a bit out of it, with an IV hooked up to his arm. Carmen rushed over to him and kissed his forehead. The doctor told Carmen that he was fairly positive Doug had pneumonia, and if everything went well, he'd be back to normal in just a few days. Carmen squeezed Doug's shoulder, relieved to hear that he'd be okay. Later that same afternoon, the infectious disease specialist at Flushing Hospital, Dr. Debbie Asnes, was pouring herself a cup of coffee in the staff break room when her pager beeped. She checked the message and saw there was an emergency downstairs and she was needed right away. Dr. Asnes raised her eyebrows. It was unusual for the infectious disease specialist to be paged to the emergency room. If she was being called, it had to be a very unusual case that required outside-of-the-box thinking. And Dr. Asnes loved a challenge. Throughout her nearly 20 years as a doctor, she'd always been drawn to puzzling cases. She'd spent a lot of her career researching HIV, and she'd witnessed firsthand how bad things could get when doctors did not understand how a disease worked. So without a second thought, she set her coffee down, headed out of the break room, and ran to the elevator. The moment the elevator doors opened back up on the ER floor, she could hear a man's voice carrying down the hallway. He was yelling about some strange woman standing near his bed. As Dr. Asnes approached, the ER doctor who had paged her popped his head out of the man's room and waved her in. The patient who was yelling was Doug. For the first few hours he'd spent in the ER, he'd mostly just slept, but he'd woken up in a sudden panic and now he was yelling incoherently at the people all around him. At the same time, Carmen, his wife, was standing by his side, trying to remind him who she was. As Dr. Asnes watched this, she immediately noticed something strange. Despite being agitated, Doug's arms and legs remained still and limp on the hospital bed. The ER doctor explained to Dr. Asnes that Doug was being treated for pneumonia, but the medical team was starting to think that that was not the right diagnosis. Ten minutes ago, Doug woke up confused and agitated and didn't recognize his wife. He started flailing his arms and the nurse ran in to restrain him, but then his arms and legs just went limp, and he'd not been able to move them since. Now Dr. Asnes understood why she had been called. Pneumonia does not make people paralyzed. Doug's symptoms were far more likely to have been caused by an infectious disease, and that was Dr. Asnes's area of expertise. And Dr. Asnes was very thankful the ER staff paged her so quickly because she now suspected that Doug's confusion was likely being caused by swelling in his brain, which is very, very dangerous. Just then, Doug suddenly went silent. Dr. Asnes bent over the bed and realized he was gasping for air. Dr. Asnes said that Doug needed to be moved to the intensive care unit in case his breathing got even worse. The ER doctor agreed and told the nurse to get Doug ready to move. Within minutes, the nurse and the ER doctor each grabbed a side of Doug's hospital bed and wheeled it out of the room. As she followed Doug, Dr. Asnes turned to Carmen and asked her to stay behind until they stabilized her husband. Then, as Doug was wheeled down the hallway, Dr. Asnes grabbed onto his bed to help steer him to the elevator. She was already thinking about which tests Doug would need. A few hours later, Dr. Asnes stood in her office reviewing Doug's charts. She had ordered a test of Doug's spinal fluid because to her, something was clearly wrong with his nervous system. But she was puzzled by the results she was looking at. The test found clear evidence of a brain infection called viral encephalitis, but Dr. Asnes was not sure that was correct. Although many of Doug's symptoms were consistent with viral encephalitis, it wouldn't explain his sudden muscle weakness. And Doug's breathing problems were more severe than the doctor normally saw in a case of viral encephalitis. 
Before Dr. Asnes could think any further, her pager sounded, and when she looked at it, she saw she was needed again in the emergency room. So Dr. Asnes ran back to the elevator, she took it down to the main floor of the hospital, and then she began running down the hallway towards the ER. But when she was only about halfway down the hallway, a colleague came out of the ER and ran right up to her and began telling her about the emergency that she was being called to. A man named Harold Marsh had been rushed in from his home in Queens, which was not far from Doug's home, after suffering a massive heart attack. But it wasn't the heart attack they wanted to talk to her about. They were afraid the heart attack was only part of this man's problems. The colleague from the ER explained to Dr. Asnes that like the first patient, Doug Wise, Harold, the second patient here, was older but active and healthy. His family reported that he had suddenly developed muscle weakness, flu symptoms, and worst of all, a staggeringly high 105 degree fever. Dr. Asnes felt a knot growing in her chest. Fevers that high were practically unheard of in heart attack patients. Dr. Asnes thanked her colleague and then just ordered Harold to be moved immediately to the ICU. Her mind was racing as she began to connect the dots. Two men living only blocks apart had both come down with the same mysterious symptoms in less than a week. This could be the beginning of an outbreak. For the moment, Harold was stable, so Dr. Asnes hurried back to her office to have some time to think. But as soon as she arrived on the fourth floor where her office was, she saw a nurse sprinting into Doug Wise's room. So Dr. Asnes ran down the hallway and went into Doug's room as well, just in time to see a colleague shove a breathing tube down Doug's throat and hook him up to a ventilator. The colleague, who was an ICU doctor, then explained to Dr. Asnes that Doug's muscle weakness was now so severe that his lungs had basically stopped working. Dr. Asnes was thankful her colleague had acted so quickly, but she was afraid this was only the first case of something much bigger. And if others out in the streets were contracting this virus, the consequences could be catastrophic. Dr. Asnes turned on her heel and rushed toward her office. She needed to alert the New York Health Department right away. Five days later, on August 27th, a medical investigator at the New York Department of Health hung up the phone in her office wishing she'd never answered it in the first place. Her name was Annie Fine, and after a long week of work, she was ready to go home. She was knee-deep in planning her wedding, and she and her fiancé had wanted to knock out as many to-do items as possible over the weekend, but instead, it looked like she would spend her weekend at Flushing Hospital. A doctor there had called in a potential outbreak on Monday, and after several days of discussions and three more patients in the hospital with identical symptoms, her boss had finally decided it was worth investigating. Dr. Fine reminded herself that, in all fairness, she was the on-call epidemiologist that weekend. That meant she would be responsible for any emergency that came up. But in addition, her boss and good friend, Dr. Marcy Layton, had asked her personally to help out. And she was always game to help Dr. Layton. So on Saturday morning, Dr. Fine woke up a minute before her alarm clock began screeching. She managed to turn it off before it had the chance to wake her fiancé. And then she quietly got out of bed. Half an hour later, she headed down the stairs of her apartment building and saw Dr. Layton's car parked outside. She smiled as she jumped into the passenger seat, and Dr. Layton laughed and apologized for interrupting her weekend plans. Then Dr. Layton handed Dr. Fine a cup of to-go coffee, and they peeled off toward Flushing Hospital. After a short drive, Dr. Fine and Dr. Layton parked near the hospital and climbed out of the car. As soon as Dr. Layton had stepped onto the curb, she made a disgusted noise, and Dr. Fine turned to look at what she was disgusted at, and she saw there was a dead crow lying in the gutter right near Dr. Layton's feet. Both doctors had been seeing dead crows all over New York that entire summer. So they both just walked around the dead bird, and the two women headed for the hospital. Right outside the ICU, the two doctors were greeted by a tall, thin man wearing a lab coat. He told Dr. Fine that he was the chief resident, which meant he was a doctor in training, standing in for Dr. Asnes, who was out of town on a family emergency. He explained that in the five days since Dr. Asnes first called the Department of Health about her first two patients, three more people had been admitted to Flushing Hospital with symptoms of viral encephalitis. All five were older people who were previously healthy and active. 
Most worrisome, all five also had other symptoms not normally caused by viral encephalitis, including fever, stomach pain, confusion, muscle weakness, and severe difficulty breathing. The chief resident added that all five patients had declined really quickly. Four were now on ventilators, and the fifth was not, but they were delirious with pain. Dr. Fine felt unnerved. All of a sudden, wedding planning was the last thing on her mind. There were usually only about 10 viral encephalitis cases every year in all of New York City. But now, one small neighborhood in New York City had five cases in less than a week. And so far, nobody had figured out why. Dr. Fine asked the resident to go collect blood samples from each of these patients and submit them for additional testing. In the meantime, she and Dr. Layton would interview the patient's families and anyone else who was with these people in the week leading up to their hospitalization. The resident nodded and then led Dr. Fine and Dr. Layton to an empty conference room where they could call people and interview them. Dr. Layton would ask the questions and Dr. Fine would take notes. By that afternoon, Dr. Fine's writing hand was totally cramped. She spent hours taking notes as she and Dr. Layton spoke with the patient's family members. Outside, it was starting to get dark, so Dr. Fine rolled her chair toward the wall and switched on the overhead lights. The conference room table was littered with textbooks, stacks of medical journals, and reports on annual encephalitis cases in New York. Dr. Fine looked over at Dr. Layton and sighed. Despite hours of interviews and poring over the patient's files, they still did not know how these five patients in Flushing Hospital had contracted encephalitis but they had found that all five patients had two things in common. First, that they all lived within a few square miles from one another in Queens, and second, they all loved to spend time outdoors in the evenings. A few of the patients, like Doug Wise, the first patient, would work in their gardens until nightfall. Others just liked to watch the sunset from their back decks or take long walks along the East River after dinner. Dr. Fine looked out the window as the street lamps flickered to life, and right as they did, it hit her people were not the only ones who loved summer evenings. It's also the time when mosquitoes are at their most active. All five of their encephalitis patients were probably swatting away mosquitoes as they gardened or walked or gazed at the sunset in the gathering darkness each night. And Dr. Fine knew something else about mosquitoes. They spread disease. Diseases like encephalitis, a condition that often strikes older people like Doug and Harold more frequently. Dr. Layton was intrigued by Dr. Fine's idea, but she was cautious. If mosquitoes really were spreading some new virus to people, they should be able to find mosquitoes infected with the disease. And so until they were able to isolate the virus in mosquitoes, then Dr. Fine's idea was really just a theory. Before the doctors left the hospital that night, Dr. Fine wrote up an alert that Dr. Layton sent to all the neighboring hospitals asking them to report any cases of viral encephalitis to the Department of Health. That way, she and Dr. Layton would know if the virus was spreading. Two days later, on the morning of September 1st, Dr. Fine sat at her desk, twisting her pencil in her hands. She was back in her office, feeling frustrated by the lab results she had just read. That morning, she and Dr. Layton had sent a small team to Northern Queens, where all these patients had lived, and the job of this team was to canvas that neighborhood and visit the houses of each encephalitis patient and try to find breeding mosquitoes. Well, that team collected several samples of mosquito larvae from standing water around the neighborhood, but none of those mosquitoes were infected with viral encephalitis. Meanwhile, Dr. Fine was still waiting for lab work to come back on the blood samples she'd collected from the five infected patients. While Dr. Fine thought about what she should do next, Dr. Layton knocked on her door. She said she had bad news. One of the encephalitis patients, Harold Marsh, had grown so weak that the doctors determined he would not recover. Moments ago, the family had decided to take him off life support. Dr. Fine's heart broke for Harold and his family. She was frustrated that she couldn't even tell them for certain what had killed their loved one. It felt like they were back at square one. But at the very least, Dr. Fine knew that the doctors at Flushing Hospital would be able to do an autopsy and take tissue samples they couldn't get while Harold was alive. Dr. Fine hoped that these samples could help them identify the virus and warn the public at large. <laughs> 
The following morning, Dr. Fine walked into her office to find her boss, Dr. Layton, waiting for her with news about Harold Marsh's autopsy tissue samples. Tests indicated that Harold had died of something called St. Louis encephalitis, a very rare strain of the disease that's only spread by mosquitoes. Dr. Layton said that federal health officials had also checked the blood samples from the other four encephalitis patients in Queens, and they found that they too had tested positive for St. Louis encephalitis. All five of the patients had gotten sick from mosquito bites. Dr. Fine frowned. On the one hand, it was nice to know that her theory that mosquitoes could have caused this was in fact what caused this. But this diagnosis didn't really make sense. The patient's symptoms were all consistent with St. Louis encephalitis, but there had never been a reported case of St. Louis encephalitis in New York City until now. In fact, there were only about 30 reported cases a year in the entire United States, and these were almost exclusively in southern swamplands. Dr. Fine wondered if infected mosquitoes had somehow migrated north, but if they had, there would have been cases of it in other places along the eastern seaboard, and so far, the only cases of it were from this outbreak in Queens. Something just didn't add up. Dr. Fine told Dr. Layton that she was glad they finally knew what was going on, but deep down, she still could not shake the feeling that there was something off about this diagnosis. A few weeks later, Dr. Fine was in her office at the Department of Health when Dr. Layton knocked on the door. When she came in, she had a very serious expression on her face. Dr. Layton explained that she'd just gotten off the phone with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and Dr. Fine's suspicions were correct. The virus they were investigating was not actually St. Louis encephalitis. It was much worse. A pathologist at the Bronx Zoo, of all places, had figured out the mistake. She'd been trying to understand why all these birds were dying all over the city, and she had discovered that they were actually contracting some form of encephalitis. And then after she learned about the St. Louis encephalitis outbreak in the city, she began to investigate whether that was what was killing all these birds. But tissue samples from the dead birds showed no sign of St. Louis encephalitis. Instead, the birds had a different strain that can easily be confused with the St. Louis strain, but it's actually much more dangerous and the birds were loaded with this different strain. In fact, the birds got this strain of encephalitis at such a high concentration that a mosquito sucking their blood could pass on the disease to the next creature it bites, including humans. And sure enough, when the CDC retested the blood of the patients at Flushing Hospital, they found that they too had the same strain of encephalitis as the birds. This strain is known as West Nile virus. West Nile is something that likely lots of people have heard of, but it's actually even more rare than the St. Louis strain, at least in the United States, because until this point, it had never been seen in the United States. It was only really seen in Africa. The CDC suspected that an infected mosquito from some other part of the world had found its way onto a plane maybe and then come to the US that way, or maybe a sick bird had gotten onto a boat and that's how the disease came to the United States. But now that this disease had crossed the ocean and arrived in the U.S., Dr. Fine knew it was here to stay. By the time the CDC put the puzzle together, as many as 1,900 residents of Northern Queens were infected with West Nile virus. 62 people landed in the hospital, and seven people died that summer in 1999 before the mosquitoes disappeared with the fall. And in the years since those initial cases, over 56,000 people have been infected in the United States. 2,776 have died as of 2022. Although the mortality rate of St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile is comparable, West Nile is far more dangerous. Because it can be carried by birds, West Nile has spread to all 50 states, while St. Louis encephalitis remains fairly localized and far less common. Doug Wise, the first patient to come in with West Nile, remained in Flushing Hospital for several weeks before he was healthy enough to transfer to a physical rehabilitation facility where he stayed for the next month. By spring of 2000, Doug was able to walk with the assistance of a special cane, but his left side never regained its former strength, and he continued to suffer episodes of short-term memory loss. But ultimately, Doug knew he was one of the lucky ones from that painful summer of 1999 he could at least still tend to his garden as long as he wore his mosquito repellent. 
Kendall Mott kept his eyes locked on the road as he drove towards the home of his father, 58-year-old George Mott. It was 6 p.m. on March 26, 1986, and the sun was hanging low in the sky over Crown Point, which is a small country town in upstate New York. A few hours earlier, 32-year-old Kendall had received a phone call from his sister Kimberly. She had called their dad multiple times over the course of that day, but all she kept getting was his answering machine, so Kimberly was worried. Part of that worry came from the fact that their dad lived alone since he had divorced their mom a few years back. On top of that, his health was declining. George was an ex-smoker, and now he had some serious issues with his lungs. He used an oxygen mask, and he'd just recovered from a bout of pneumonia that had sent him to the hospital for a few days. Kimberly was afraid their dad might have fallen or passed out, or maybe even something worse. She knew it would be somewhat convenient for Kendall to stop by their dad's place on his way home from work, so she called him and begged him to go by and make sure their dad was okay. And of course, Kendall had said yes. But as Kendall drove through the woods down a lonely two-lane road, he really wasn't too worried. He had visited with their dad at his house two days earlier. George was taking his medications and was in good spirits considering all the issues he'd been dealing with. Kendall was sure there was a reasonable explanation for why George wasn't answering his phone. Maybe George's friends picked him up and took him to a local diner called The Wagon Wheel, where Kendall knew they liked to hang out. If that was the case, then Kendall knew he wouldn't be gone for very long, and so Kendall planned to just wait inside the house until his dad came home, and then once he was back and he knew he was okay, Kendall would call Kimberly and everything would be fine. And regardless of if there was a problem or not with his dad, Kendall was happy to pop by because he was close with his dad. His dad used to be a firefighter, and he was very devoted to his profession. He spent long hours at the station away from the family. But since his retirement a few years ago, he was much more present in the lives of Kendall, Kimberly, and their children. And that really made Kendall happy. A few minutes later, Kendall pulled off the main road and began making his way down a long driveway that wound between tall maple trees. George lived in a tiny one-bedroom house in a sparsely populated area about four miles west of town. It was very peaceful and quiet and green out there. The nearest neighbor lived about a half mile away. At the end of the driveway, Kendall parked his car a few feet away from his dad's house. He hopped out and then walked up to the front door. But as he got closer, he noticed that the windows near the front door looked a little bit different. They had a dark tint to them kind of like the windows on a limousine. Kendall thought that was very strange, and he figured he would investigate once he got inside. And so Kendall got up to the front door and he knocked, but his dad didn't come to the door. And so Kendall reached down and tried the doorknob, and right away he felt two things. One, he felt the doorknob was already unlocked, and two, most importantly, he noticed the doorknob was hot to the touch. And immediately, a bolt of fear shot through Kendall, because a hot doorknob could mean there was a fire raging inside the house. And so Kendall immediately whipped open the door and looked inside, but there was no fire. In fact, the house was totally quiet and nearly pitch black. Kendall instinctively reached over and flipped the light switch, but the lights didn't turn on in the house. Even worse, there was this thick, dark haze hanging in the air that was impossible to see through. It smelled a little like smoke, but it also had this strange, sweet odor to it that made it much more unsettling. Everything Kendall was experiencing just felt totally dangerous. Whatever was going on here, Kendall knew it had to be bad, especially given the fact that his dad had lung issues. Breathing in whatever was in the air could not be good for him. So Kendall stepped into the front living room and yelled out for his dad, but there was no reply. Kendall felt his way through the furniture in the living room towards the back of the house to the bedroom where his dad slept, but when he got there, again, he just couldn't see anything. Kendall was really starting to panic now. He was desperate to get his hands on a flashlight, but he didn't have one, and he didn't have one in his car, and so Kendall turned, sprinted outside, got into his car, and sped over to the house next door to see if the neighbor had a flashlight. Luckily, the neighbor was home, and they did have a flashlight, and so after explaining what was going on, the two of them raced back over to George's house with this flashlight. But when Kendall arrived back at his dad's front door, he stopped. 
He was holding out hope that his dad was not home and that he was safe and that whatever was going on inside of his house had nothing to do with his dad. But Kendall also realized that now that they had this flashlight, when the neighbor went in there and shined it around, he might reveal something totally horrible to Kendall. And suddenly Kendall standing there right in front of the door, he just felt like he couldn't handle that. He couldn't go in and see whatever happened to his dad. So Kendall stayed outside as the neighbor clicked on his flashlight, pulled the collar of his t-shirt up over his nose and mouth and stepped into the house. The next few minutes were agonizing for Kendall as he waited to hear what was hidden beneath the black haze inside his father's home. Finally, the neighbor emerged from the house, and from the grim expression on the man's face, Kendall could tell something horrible had happened. Within the next hour, the house was filled with inspectors from the local police and fire departments, and all of them were deeply confused by the scene laid out before them. It didn't take them long to determine that a fire had broken out inside of George's house, but the way the fire behaved just didn't make sense. As the inspectors stepped through the front door and into the living room, they could see that there was a layer of black soot covering everything. But nothing in the room was actually burnt. It was clear that it had gotten very hot inside of that house. Sitting on a table in the middle of the room were three pill bottles that had all melted together into one plastic clump. There was also a nail hammered into the wall, and hanging from it was the metal handle of a fly swatter. But the flat plastic square that actually swats the flies, that part had melted off. Inspectors found other plastic objects in the living room that were warped or liquefied, but there was plenty of other stuff inside the house that should have melted, but for some reason didn't. There was a plastic model of an old sailing vessel that sat on the coffee table not far from the fly swatter and pill bottles, but it looked as good as new. There was also a stack of cassette tapes that sat next to the stereo that looked unaltered and ready to be played. The right side of the living room opened out into a small kitchen. George had decorated the sides of the refrigerator with colorful wallpaper, and that paper showed zero signs of burning. But inside the refrigerator was a totally different story. The butter was completely melted, along with the plastic butter dish. In the meat drawer was an unopened package of hot dogs, and they were all cooked. The inspectors struggled to comprehend what actually happened. How could a refrigerator turn into an oven on the inside while the outside of it was totally unaffected by the heat? And things got even weirder as the inspectors moved to the back of the house to George's bedroom. As they stepped inside, inspectors could see the TV on George's wooden dresser was caved in on the top where the plastic shell had melted down into itself. But the dresser it was sitting on was good as new, aside from the layer of soot that covered it. In the corner of the bedroom was George's oxygen machine. Not only was it undamaged by the heat, it was still running when the inspectors arrived. Resting on top of that machine was George's plastic oxygen mask. Unlike the television, the mask had not melted. This was made all the more strange because the mask and the machine were just inches from the bed, where clearly an intense fire had raged within the last day. Now the fire was out, leaving behind a scorched, tangled mess. The wooden bed frame was charred in places, but it was still standing up. The mattress, however, was totally destroyed. The stuffing was all burnt up, and the net of metal mattress springs were melted in a way that made them curve down into a V-shape under the bed. You could actually see through those springs and underneath the bed, where a large hole had burned through the floorboards. But as the inspectors crouched down to take a closer look into that hole, they could see that something else had burned up in this strange fire. Tangled in the mattress springs was a man's foot, burned off near the ankle. Near the headboard was a charred fragment of a human skull. Beyond that, they found tiny piles of fine black ash in the wreckage of the bed, as well as in the crawl space beneath the floorboards. Those ashes, along with the foot and the skull fragment, were all that remained of Kendall's father, George Mott. Before he died, George was a pretty big, sturdy guy, weighing in over 180 pounds, 
What was left of him now weighed about three pounds, easily fitting inside a shoebox. The confusion amongst the inspectors only continued to grow after finding George. George wasn't just burned. He essentially had been cremated. Cremation is the process where a dead body is burned to ashes, and it requires an immensely hot fire that burns inside of a special oven. Yet somehow, here George was, reduced to ash by this bizarre fire that only affected small portions of the house. It just didn't add up. If the temperature in the bedroom was hot enough to cremate George, how on earth was the house even still standing? But there was yet another mystery hanging over the scene. How did a fire as powerful as this one get ignited in the first place? The inspectors checked the electrical outlets, they checked the gas lines that ran in the crawl space under George's bedroom, they completely dismantled the gas furnace that straddled the bedroom and the living room, and they could not find a single shred of physical evidence that might explain how George caught on fire. A few days later, the New York State police inspectors finally just gave up. They couldn't see any signs that foul play had occurred, so they filed a final report that simply stated that George's death was, quote, accidental. Then they closed the book on the case. But there was one inspector with the Essex County Fire Department who wasn't ready to give up so fast. That man's name was Tony Moret. Tony was 37 years old and had worked in the fire department since he was 16. He had known George Mott personally, they'd worked side by side as firemen, and Tony really liked George. So he was determined to find out what really happened to his friend. On top of all the weird anomalies they found at the scene of the fire, Tony was puzzled by one more thing. He knew George was obsessed with fire safety. Tony just couldn't believe that George would be careless enough to accidentally set himself on fire. But after hundreds of hours exploring every possibility for what could have happened to George, he was getting really frustrated. Tony knew a lot about the science of fire, but none of those scientific rules seemed to apply to what he was observing inside of George's house. Finally, one of Tony's colleagues gave him a tip about an organization down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania that might be able to help. They were called Parascience International, and they specialized in the study of strange phenomena that couldn't be explained by traditional science. Tony was hesitant at first. When he thought of the paranormal, he thought of things like Bigfoot and UFOs and the Loch Ness Monster. To him, any organization that believed in those sorts of things was an organization he couldn't really take seriously. But he was desperate to find out what happened to George, and his own investigation had reached a dead end, and so he didn't really have anything to lose by considering a different perspective, even if it was totally unorthodox. So, in April of 1986, a few weeks after George's ashes were discovered, Tony took a deep breath, then picked up the phone and made the call to Parascience International. When the phone rang 400 miles away in Harrisburg, it was answered by a man named Larry Arnold. Larry was a 37-year-old school bus driver during the day, but in his off time, he devoted many hours to this group of parascience experts. For the last 10 years, Larry had worked with them to investigate many strange and unusual events. But Larry's greatest passion was studying fire phenomena that defied explanation. So when Tony told Larry what he needed help with, Larry was immediately interested. Larry listened intently as Tony flooded him with details about the strange case of George Mott. The body reduced to fine ash, the lack of damage to things near the body, the inexplicable pattern of melting and burning throughout the house. The more Larry heard, the more intrigued he became. And so by the end of this call, Larry said he'd be happy to drive up to Crown Point, examine George's house, and see if he could make any sense of it. And a few weeks later, that's just what Larry did. When he arrived in Crown Point, he met with Tony at George's home. It had been over a month since the fire, but George's family was still in shock and were totally undecided about what to do with the house, so the inside really wasn't all that different from the way the inspectors first found it. 
As soon as he stepped through the door and into the living room, Larry noticed that the shelves and the tabletops all had a strange glaze on them. It wasn't just soot or ash that you could brush away with your hand. It was almost like baked on, like melted caramel. Right away, a picture began to form in Larry's mind of what could have happened the day George caught on fire. And so Larry headed straight to the back of the house and into George's bedroom. George's remains had been removed, but Larry could still see the area that had burned and how it hadn't spread beyond the bed and the hole in the floorboards. Larry, like every other inspector who had been inside of George's home, couldn't find anything nearby that could have possibly ignited the blaze, but to Larry Arnold, that actually wasn't the least bit surprising. Tony and the other investigators had never seen anything as confounding as this case, but Larry had. It was extremely rare, but in his research for Parascience International, Larry had uncovered about 200 recorded cases that were similar to George Mott's. For example, in the year 1725, a Parisian innkeeper found his wife had burned down to a pile of ashes in the middle of their kitchen floor. Nothing around her was damaged from this fire, not even the wooden cooking utensils that laid close to her charred remains. In 1951, a landlady visited one of the tenants of her apartment building in St. Petersburg, Florida. When she grabbed the doorknob, she found it hot to the touch, and when she opened the door, she found the tenant's body had been incinerated into ashes, except for her skull and one of her feet. Inches away from the body was a pile of newspapers that showed no signs of burning. Another example, in 1970, an 89-year-old widow was found burnt down into a pile of ashes in her home in Dublin, Ireland. The only recognizable remains were her two feet, which were burnt off near the ankles. She had a vase with plastic flowers sitting on a table in the center of the room. The flowers had melted into a puddle, but everything else in the room appeared to be more or less untouched. In nearly all of these similar cases, Larry noted the same common threads. There was often a strange, sweet smell reported, and a weird, ashy glaze that seemed to coat everything. There was very little damage to the space surrounding the burned remains, and there was no clear indication of what could have possibly ignited the blaze in the first place. For hundreds of years, scientists and scholars had been developing theories behind how these strange fire events could happen, and the only feasible explanation they could come up with was that these intense fires were actually ignited from inside the bodies of the victims. Back in the 1800s, many believed this was God's judgment delivered to those who led an immoral life. Some thought it could be a byproduct of alcoholism, with the excess alcohol increasing the body's flammability. As the decades passed, many, many other theories have also been put forward to explain how a human body that is 60% water could spontaneously ignite. Larry Arnold had his own theories. He knew the human body was full of electrical activity that pulsed through the brain, the nervous system, and through every heartbeat. So what if the electricity somehow got amplified? Could the body start an explosive electrical fire that burnt itself out from the inside? Could it burn fast enough and hot enough that it incinerated the victim without burning anything nearby? Whatever the cause, this strange and rare event eventually became so widely known that it got its own name. Spontaneous Human Combustion When Tony heard Larry's theory, he thought it sounded crazy, but he also thought it made more sense than any other explanation he'd heard for what happened to George. By the time Tony officially finished his own investigation into the death of George Mott, he concluded that the cause was spontaneous human combustion. But despite Tony's support of this theory, the official reports by police never changed for George Mott. His death is still listed as accidental, with no mention of spontaneous human combustion. While there are many believers in the theory, the vast majority of scientists dismiss spontaneous human combustion as pseudoscience that is unsupported by physical evidence. And the physical evidence in this case is still contradictory and confusing. 
But despite not fully understanding what happened, for instance, why the outside of George's refrigerator was untouched while the hot dogs inside were cooked through, Larry felt confident in his conclusion that George Mott was indeed a victim of spontaneous human combustion. According to the wishes of George's family, his ashes were sent to a crematorium, along with his foot and what was left of his skull. Then, after that second burning, George Mott was scattered at sea and finally laid to rest. Thank you for listening to Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure to come back next week because we put out a brand new mind-boggling medical mystery each week. From Ballin Studios and Wondery, this is Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, hosted by me, Mr. Ballin. A quick reminder, the content in this episode is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This episode was written by Matt Olmos. Our editor is Heather Dundas. Sound design is by Ryan Potesta. Coordinating producer is Sophia Martins. Our senior producer is Alex Benedon. Our associate producers and researchers are Sarah Vitak and Natalie Bettendorf. Fact-checking was done by Sheila Patterson. For Ballin Studios, our producer is Alyssa Tomineng. Our head of production is Zach Levitt. Executive producers are myself, Mr. Ballin, and Nick Witters. For Wondery, senior managing producer is Ryan Lohr. Our head of sound is Marcelino Villapondo. Our producer is 